Okay, let's, uh, let's begin. Um, I know that uh, tonight is about Firenze, and I will get to Firenze, but I realized that um, we ran out of time uh, on Freud, and I, I wasn't able to address one major theme in uh, Freud's work that uh, I really think any overview of Freudian thought cannot afford to ignore, and that is uh, Freud's whole theory of religion. Uh, so I wanted to start off with that tonight, and uh, that may take us up to the break, or hopefully not. Hopefully we can turn to Forenzi, but if we don't finish on Forenzi in the second half, we'll pick it up again at the beginning next week, so we'll cover all of the material. So um, Freud's uh, five really four main statements regarding religion. Um, the first is in 1907 in his uh, essay Obsessive Acts and Religious Practices. And uh, then the second is in 1913 in Totem and Taboo. The third in 1927, Future of an Illusion, a whole book devoted to the topic. And um, the fourth in chapter one only, really, of Civilization and Its Discontents. Um, there's a fifth major statement that concerns religion, and of course that's Moses and monotheism, um, but 1939, but I don't think Moses and monotheism actually adds anything to his specific theory of religion. Um, so I'm going to concentrate uh, on these four uh, building blocks. Um, so going back to 1907, Obsessive Acts and Religious Practices, uh, he simply observes the, the parallel between the rituals of obsessive neurotics, um, you know, having to step on every line uh, in the pavement or not on any of the lines or touch every lamppost on the way to school, and if you miss one, you've got to go back and start all over again. Um, and, uh, you have a problem? Well, it's... it's okay. Okay. Um, so the, the, the obsessive uh, rituals and compulsive acts of, of uh, obsessional neurotics bear a strong resemblance to the ritual practices of the religious. Um, the priest who has to uh, celebrate the Mass in a whole series of movements, and if he misses one step, he has to start over again. Uh, the Orthodox Jew dovening. Um, these bear a strong resemblance. And uh, so Freud makes this incredible leap uh, um, in which he concludes that religion is nothing more than a collective obsessional neurosis, and an obsessional neurosis is nothing other than a private religion. And the implication is that if the obsessional neurotic can exchange his private religion and buy into something like uh, a strict Roman Catholicism, then he doesn't need his private religion anymore. Uh, he's not looking like an obsessional neurotic. He's just saying the rosary several times a day. Um, okay, the thing to notice about this is, is, is it, it bears all the marks of Freud's overall strategy, which is a reductive strategy. He's hostile to religion, and he's always, re he's always <coughs> reducing religion to the pathological. Religion is nothing other than a collective obsessional neurosis, really. It, it's not that he uh, <coughs> has a totally negative... Uh, I mean, he sees positive social consequences of religion. Um, he sees that religion performs what he sees as a necessary social function. Because to live in society, we have to repress our incestuous and aggressive drives, and um, we have to commit this act of renunciation in favor of society. Um, and religion offers us various compensations. If you believe that you're going to get your reward in heaven, then that makes it a little easier to bear uh, the pains of this world. Uh, as, as Marx points out, religion is the opium of the people. If you think you're going to get your reward in heaven, it makes it easier for you to um, put up with overt social injustice in this life 
because the good will get their reward in the next and the bad will be punished in the next. So in this way, religion does perform certain uh, social functions as far as Freud is concerned, but, but essentially he sees it as a, a psychopathological phenomenon. I mean, as far as Freud and Freudians are concerned, uh, any person who is religious is, is confessing that they remain neurotic. That's the pretty much the mainstream Freudian attitude toward religion. Okay, he takes a second step in totem and taboo, and uh, he's studying totemic, uh, well, he's not studying them himself, but he's looking at the anthropological, James uh, Frazier's famous work on um, totemic religion, and uh, <coughs> so these are our religions, uh, these are societies which are organized into totem groups, clans. So is the, you know, there's the clan, the snake clan, the eagle clan, the lion clan, and uh, there's a sacred animal at the head of the totem pole, at the head of the clan. Um, there is strict incest taboo, but it's a very wide incest taboo. You have to marry outside the clan. So an eagle woman cannot marry an eagle clan man. She has to find a man who's serpent or bear clan or whatever. You have to marry outside the clan. Um, the sacred animal that is the head of the clan must not be slain or eaten, except once a year it's slain uh, and eaten. Um, Freud immediately sees the comparison to Christianity, which is the Jesus clan, and once a year Jesus is slain and eaten, and ceremonially this is the Eucharist, this is the Christian Mass. Um, the, the, and all of this for Freud echoes what he first advances as a historical myth, but then over time he seems to want to take it literally, he seems to advance it literally, that is his theory of the primal horde. Um, we once were uh, horde animals um, with a dominant, an alpha male, and the alpha male uh, uh, keeps all the women to himself and drives the bachelors away. When the old man's back is turned, a bachelor sneaks up and tries to mount one of the females, and the alpha male charges him and will kill him unless the bachelor does a submissive gesture, like turns and offers up his behind to the old man, um, in which case the old man will back off and not slay him. Um, Freud says this is the way we were before the rise of society, before the rise of law, and um, one day, the bachelors got fed up with this situation and banded together and slew the old man. Um, and this is the primal crime. Um, this is the killing of God. And this is the origin of society, as far as Freud is concerned. Uh, uh, society begins with a murder. Um, because having slain the old man, whom they hated, um, they now, he was also their protector. And so, uh, once he's gone, that's a loss. Um, they look around at one another, and they're confronted with, I guess, the Hobbesian problem. Are we now going to have a perpetual war among chieftains to see who's going to take over the dominant position? Um, and the only way to avoid this is to establish law, uh, to establish the incest taboo. Um, and so this is the, the dawn of society. Uh, but in, in passing, there's, there's um, a second, uh, uh, certainly, a, that there's his view of Christianity. Um, it's, uh, it's all about murder. It's all about guilt for murdering God. And there's a parallel with Catholic teaching here. It's like this is the primal crime. And, and all, uh, the, the guilt that you and I suffer as individuals is not entirely guilt that's arising from our own personal Oedipus complex. Part of the guilt we suffer is, is an inherited collective guilt. Um, this is almost like the idea of an inherited ori original sin in Augustinian uh, theology. Um, 
I mean, our guilt is combined then of two elements. It's this inherited sin, and, and then it's our own sinful, uh, guilty feelings arising from our own personal Oedipus complex. So here, here he certainly, um, this is an Oedipal theory of, of religion. Um, it's grounded in a crime. Um, it's all about various prohibitions and atonements, attempts to atone for this crime. Uh, okay. So then step three is in 1927. Now here Freud really shifts ground. Uh, it's not just an obsessional neurosis. It's not just rooted in Oedipal guilt. Um, he brings in an existential uh, element here. Actually, this has not been sufficiently recognized. This is a real shift in his theory. He's tracing this now to, um, he's adding an element of human helplessness. Nothing to do with the Oedipus complex. It's just that as, as infants and children, of course, we're helpless, but he points out that as adults, we remain helpless. I mean, our lives can be extinguished in the twinkling of an eye. Um, this is part of the human condition. We're all faced with impending death, and um, uh, we long for the protection uh, of, a, of a powerful, well, the classical conception of definition of God is a, a being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent. The three classical characteristics, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. Um, and Freud says we long, because of our helplessness, we long for the protection of a father. He always says father. You know, you read these two books, and, you know, he's describing human helplessness and the, the longing for the protection <coughs> of, uh, and you expect him to say mother, he never says mother. It's always father. I mean, he's a deeply patriarchal thinker. You know, the mother is repressed. The mother is that pre edible period that he says remains dark, shadowy, <laughs> a dark continent for him. Um, and, and uh, out of our helplessness, we generate a wishful illusion. I mean, as in his dream theory. Dream, what are dreams? Dreams are disguised hallucinatory wish, wish fulfillments. And that's pretty much, much what religion is now. It's an obsessional neurosis. It's rooted in the Oedipus complex. And it's all about guilt uh, for murder, murderous wishes. It's also a wishful fantasy, a wishful illusion, a defense against feelings of helplessness and anxiety, a defense against existential anxiety, which generates this illusion. Oh, and by the way, here's another uh, point that hasn't been noticed enough, I don't think, in, in, in uh, comments on Freud's theory of religion. In 1927, in The Future of an Illusion, he defines religion as illusion. Three years later, in Civilization and its, and its Discontents, he defines religion as delusion. And he gives no explanation as to why he has switched from illusion to delusion. In, in Future of an Illusion, he makes a very careful distinction between illusion and delusion. What's the definition? An illusion is something that cannot be scientifically known to be either true or false, like the existence of God. Science cannot pro disprove the existence of God. Uh, therefore, atheism is, strictly speaking, an irrational position. To say that God does not exist cannot be proven. Um, uh, so, in 1927, he's not taking an atheistic position, he's taking an agnostic position. He's calling religion an illusion, which is something that cannot be known to be true or false, but that you, you believe if you believe because you want it to be true. An in, in illusion is something you believe on the basis of your desire for it to be true, even though it cannot be known to be true or false. 
Okay? So religion is illusion in 1927. In 1930, religion is delusion. He has shifted from agnosticism to atheism without any discussion as to why uh, he's making this, this change. Now, I think he's put himself in a difficult position by, by shifting to atheism because he, 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 now, he now is saying, you know, God does not exist. The idea that he exists is a delusion. So he's saying God does not exist. That's atheism. He can't prove that. So why is he saying it? Because he wants it to be true that God does not exist, which makes his theory, by his own definition, an illusion. Yeah. In all fairness, you can't prove any negative statement right or wrong. Right, right, right. And that, this is just an instance of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, you know, by his own definition, he is now holding the illusion of believing something on the basis of his desire that it be true, even though he can't prove that it's true. He himself... Do people follow this? Are you getting this? Can you repeat that last statement? Okay, he, he defines an illusion as a belief that you hold because you want it to be true, even though you cannot know that it's true. Okay, Freud is now saying God does not exist. That's, but he can't know that God does not exist. So he's he's believing that because he wants it to be so true. It's an illusion it's, yeah, he's, it's exactly his desire. the same thing, just forever. So he's now holding an illusion. Okay? Yeah. Now now in, in fairness, um, here, one has one has to make a distinction, I believe, between um, practical atheism and theoretical atheism. Theoretical atheism on the level of a belief, is an impossible position to hold. <coughs> God does not exist. No one can prove that. Um, but you have to distinguish that from practical atheism. Practical atheism is, uh, I'm going to operate my life on the assumption that God does not exist. I'm not saying he doesn't exist, because I can't prove he doesn't exist, but I'm going to operate as if he doesn't exist unless I get some damn good proof that he does. Um, so you can be an agnostic on the theoretical level and yet a practical atheist. Because on the theoretical level you're saying, which is the only rational thing to say, I cannot know whether God exists or not. You're saying that, but you're saying also I'm going to behave as if he doesn't exist unless I get some solid evidence that he does. Um, okay. Future of an illusion. And then the final step really, in, in his theory of religion, he takes in chapter one of Civilization and Its Discontents in 1930. Um, and this chapter is about mysticism. Because the French um, writer and critic, Romain Roland, wrote to Freud after he published The Future of an Illusion, and he said, I really agree with you uh, to a large extent about your view of religion as uh, infantile, uh, where's that passage? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll find this passage later, but um, Freud is Oh, here, here it is. It says, the common man, this is from civilization, it's discontents, the common man cannot imagine this providence, this God, otherwise than in the figure of an enormously exalted father. Well, there again, mother is ruled out. Uh, only such a being can understand the needs of the children of men and be softened by their prayers and placated by the signs of their remorse. <coughs> Now, here's the part I wanted to draw attention. The whole thing is so patently infantile, so foreign to reality, that to anyone with a friendly attitude to humanity, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life. He's embarrassed for his fellow human beings for being so bloody infantile as to buy this... <coughs> illusion of a big daddy watching over and you know I mean Freud is embarrassed um, 
Anyway, Roland, Romain Roland writes to him and says, you're right about the infantile nature. The, your, your theory of religion as a crutch um, is correct to a large extent. But you've missed, Roland says, you've missed the origin of, of healthy religion. You've missed the origin of true religion, which is in uh, the experience of eternity, the mystical experience of oneness with God and with nature, um, what Freud called the oceanic experience. Um, uh, Freud replies in this first chapter, he says, well, first of all, I've never had this oceanic oneness, eternity kind of experience personally. But if I had, like every other experience, it's open to interpretation as to what it means. Uh, and I will tell you what I think it means. I think it means that the mystic who has this experience is either psychotic because he's lost the I, not I, the self-other distinction, and he's saying all is one. That's either psychotic, or if the mystic is not psychotic, he is a person who has the capacity to hang on to reality in maybe like nine out of ten sectors of the mind while taking the elevator all the way down to the most primitive <coughs> layer of the mind, which, then, uh, which which Freud called primary narcissism. Freud believed that for that certainly in the womb and for some weeks after birth, the child is the infant is has no I not I distinction. It's an unboundary state. We now know Freud was wrong about. This is one area. By the way, everybody's saying psychoanalysis, you know, the psychologists, the research people, they're always, saying psycho they're always saying psychoanalysis is not a science because nothing can be proved or disproved empirically. Psychoanalysis just goes on like an ideology. Well, this is false because here we have a wonderful instance. I may have already made this point. We have this w a wonderful instance where psychoanalysis has changed in response to empirical evidence. The infant research. The infant research shows that primary narcissism as a stage when there's no I, not I distinction has been shot down. And the people who advance that theory, the followers of Margaret Mahler, uh, Fred Pine, Otto Kernberg, they fought for 15 or 20 years against the infant research. And then they finally caved and threw in the towel and <laughs> said, okay, there's no symbiosis, there's no autism. This is what Melanie Klein said from the beginning, by the way. And this was the first big departure of Melanie Klein from the Freudian tradition. She said there's a primitive ego engaged in object relations, relations with objects, from the beginning of life. That's what makes her an object relationship <coughs> theorist. There is no primary narcissism. Um, anyway, Freud is responding to Roland and saying the mystic experience of oneness comes out of that stage of primary narcissism. This is oceanic, unboundaried. In other words, it's regression. It's a severe regression. But he allows that some mystics are able to regress in one sector of the mind while hanging on to reality in another, other sectors of the mind. But again, it's pathological. He's pathologizing. Um, so it's an obsessional neurosis. It's rooted in incest and murder, the Oedipus complex. It's based on an infantile, wishful illusion. It's a delusion, and mysticism is a regression to the most primitive state of the mind. That's Freud's view of religion. Question. Could you comment on uh, the parallels, if there is any, um, between Freud's relationship with his father and this rather paternalistic view, taking a shot at this omniscient person? Well, yeah, Freud, there's a wonderful book on this. Uh, hi, by the way. Hi. <laughs> um, there's a, a great book on this uh, by Deborah Margolis called Freud and His Mother. It's not easy to obtain. I think it's out of print, but it's well worth trying to get a hold of. Deborah Margolis, Freud and His Mother. Um, well, he had a very disturbed... I mean, the, the evidence is that his mother was extremely narcissistic. Um, and... Um, the evidence is that he hated her, but couldn't face it, uh, and, and just buried it. And she, li she lived into her 90s. In his 70s, he was still visiting her 
every Saturday morning. Um, whereas his father uh, died when Freud was in his 40s. Um, the evidence is that Freud, um, there's a second reason why Freud displaced the action upwards from the pre-edible to the edible. Because he was hurt in the pre-edible area. That's where the mother is so important in the pre-edible period. Um, and he had this trouble with his mother. He's displaced everything upwards into the uh, edible phase. He also lost his Catholic nanny. And he, oh, this is relevant to our theory of religion. He had this Catholic nanny. Uh, and she took him to Mass with her, Czech. She was Czech. She took, uh, took him to Mass. And he would come home from Mass. He was really impressed with the Catholic Mass. And he would come home to his Jewish family, and at dinner he would imitate the priest, and he would give a sermon. Okay. Um, the mother suddenly fired the Catholic nanny. Now, nannies are always getting fired by mothers because the mothers get jealous. Uh, uh, of the fact that the kid is getting attached to the uh, nanny. But it seems that there was more going on here. Uh, certainly, it looks like the, n the, n the mother not only fired the nanny, she sent her to jail. Mm. Uh, and, and, and what they, they found in the nanny's possession, some little objects, some little coins, the sort of things that a little boy might give as a present to his beloved nanny. They found those in the nanny's possession, and the mother used that to charge her with theft and sent her to prison. Um, one writer, a um, uh, historian by the name of Paul Witz, um, on the basis of fairly slim evidence, and he doesn't present it as the truth, but as a, as a hypothesis. You know, in those days, Freud, Freud's father was still a traveling uh, salesman, and he was away for long stretches of time. And his two sons uh, were from his previous marriage were the same age as his new wife, Amelie. And one of the sons was living right across the street. And Freud's got this beautiful new wife, 21, 22, and there's his 20-year-old son living across the street, and the father's away a lot. And if anything funny was going on, the nanny would know. And the nanny was suddenly fired and sent to prison. So it's a bit speculative, <laughs> but who knows? Who knows? But, uh, but, but the point is that the loss of this nanny was a pre edible trauma. Right? This is a pre edible And we actually we have a local uh, analyst um, uh, who has written really interesting papers about this. I'm blocking on the name. Do you know who I'm referring yeah, to? Yeah, I do. Ha Harden. Harry, Harry Harden. Harden. He, he wrote three papers in the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic quite a number of years ago, all about uh, nannies and about Freud and his nanny. Um, now, Hardin was trained at the Menninger, and they were really into working as a team, a, psych, a psych psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, <coughs> social worker, psychologist. The psychologist would do the, the psychological testing of the patient. The social worker would do the whole family history. And when Hardin heard that um, his patient had had a nanny, he would send the social worker to in New York, <coughs> if necessary, to interview the nanny. Okay? Uh, because uh, what, what, what Hardin was finding is that, for example, one, one, one kind of thing that he would find is that there are some men who always have to have two women in their lives. As a little boy, they had two women, mother and the nanny. And that often, now I'm not saying every man who has two women, <laughs> I'm not saying that's the only reason to have two women, but um, it can be a reason sometimes. Yeah? Um, in his response to this uh, oceanic experience that, that people told him about, right. did he not mention in, in the regression to the primary narcissistic phase that the mother's breast was in fact a big part of that? Yes. So yes, he does. There, that is sort of an exception to his patriarchy and religion totality, isn't it? He, uh, I don't know whether it would qualify. I mean, he, he's, he was well aware, obviously, of the mother's existence. Um, he was well aware of the dark continent. He was well aware of what he called the Minoan Mycenaean yeah. lair. He knew that mother was there. Uh, he said that it will be the women analysts who tell us about it because 
they can tolerate the transference. They, they can tolerate being turned into a breast or a womb by their <coughs> patients, whereas I am very uncomfortable with this. Uh, so, you know, he doesn't deny the mother, but he mostly makes her a target of Oedipal desire. Um, it, there, there are exceptions to this. And, and you can find everything in Freud's writings, because he was a genius. He says almost everything. Um, but, you know, you have to look at what he says more and what he says less. And overall, I, I think he pretty much strips the mother of power and significance you know, as an overall trend in his thinking. Um, okay, so that's uh, pretty much the theory of religion, but I, I wanted to draw attention to a couple of aspects of it. See, for years, um, uh, for, for many years, I, uh, uh, I've, I've always identified with uh, Christianity, and uh, I still do. Uh, nowadays, um, I call myself a secular Christian. I, saw, I call myself a Christian atheist. And that's because of years of struggle with Freud, and Freud won. Because I, 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 I was into that whole tradition of uh, Paul Tillich-style demythologizing Rudolf Bultmann wonderful theologian who says that the New Testament is to be read as poetry and myth. My teacher at the University of Toronto many years ago, Northrop Fry, mm -hmm. the Bible is metaphor. Uh, 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 Fry says the Bible is a tissue of metaphors from beginning to end. Uh, and that's how it's to be understood. And, and I had contempt for people who take it literally, fundamentalists. And I thought, you know, well, Freud is absolutely right. Um, uh, about this literalistic, supernaturalist, uh, magical uh, kind of religion. But, but Freud, I thought, was profoundly wrong in making, in equating all religion with this religious literalism. Um, but there are these passages in Freud where he, he's well aware of the demythologizing tradition. He's well aware of it, and he attacks it. And, and these passages troubled me for years, because I wanted to think of myself as still legitimately religiously Christian, even though I never had any patience for magical thinking or supernaturalism. Uh, I wanted to believe that I was still somehow traditionally a religious Christian, even though I didn't believe in a supernatural God. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the smells and the bells of Anglo-Catholicism. Um, but here are these passages. Um, okay. Um, so, um, you know, he's, saying, he's talking about some people who try to uh, justify belief on the... Uh, <coughs> You know, they say the assertions of religion cannot be refuted by, by reason, can't prove God does not exist, so why should I not believe in them, since they have so much on their side, tradition, the agreement of mankind, and all the consolations they offer, why not indeed? Just as no one can be forced to believe, so no one can be forced to disbelieve. But do not let us be satisfied with deceiving ourselves that arguments like these take us along the road to correct thinking. If ever there was a case of a lame excuse, we have it here. Ignorance is ignorance. No right to believe anything can be derived from ignorance. In other matters, no sensible person will behave so irresponsibly or rest content with such feeble grounds for his opinions and for the line he takes. It is only in the highest and most sacred things that he allows himself to do so. And here's the passage that used to really get me. It is only in the highest and most sacred things that he allows himself to do so. In reality, these are only attempts at pretending to oneself or to other people that one is still firmly attached to religion, when one has long since cut oneself loose from it. Where questions of religion are concerned, people are guilty of every possible sort of dishonesty and intellectual misdemeanor. Philosophers stretch the meaning of words until they retain scarcely anything of their original sense. 
So for Paul Tillich and the existential Christians, uh, God becomes Heidegger's being, spelt with a capital B. This is a philosopher, <laughs> this is the philosopher stretching the meaning of words until they retain scarcely anything of their original sense. They give the name of God to some vague abstraction which they've created for themselves. Having done so, they can pose before all the world as deists, as believers in God, and they can even boast that they have recognized a higher, purer concept of God. So Paul Tillich says, in order to be authentically uh, a Christian, you must first become an atheist. Because God is simply, your, your notion of God is simply an idol, which you have to outgrow. And only when you've outgrown this idol are you in a position to become open to what Tillich calls the God beyond God which is still God. Um, uh, this is the higher, purer concept of God that Freud's referring to here. Um, notwithstanding that their God is now nothing more than an insubstantial shadow and no longer the mighty personality of religious doctrines. Critics persist in describing as deeply religious anyone who admits to a sense of man's insignificance or impotence in the face of the universe Although what constitutes the essence of the religious attitude is not this feeling, but only the next step after it, the reaction to it which seeks a remedy for it. The man who goes no further, but humbly acquiesces in the small part which human beings play in the great world, such a man is, on the contrary, irreligious in the truest sense of the word. So that used to haunt me, that passage about people pretending to still be religious even though they've long since really uh, ceased to be. So that's a passage from page 32 of Future of an Illusion. Now here's another passage. This is the second one that got me. And finally, uh, uh, Civilization and its Discontents, page 74. Um, so he's talking about the image of God as a, an exalted father. The whole thing is so infantile. Uh, it's, it's painful to think that most people will never be able to rise above this infantile. Uh, now here's the passage. It is still more humiliating to discover how large a number of people living today who cannot but see that this religion is not tenable, nevertheless try to defend it piece by piece in a series of pitiful rearguard actions. There's the whole of theology. <laughs> pitiful rearguard actions. Um, one would like, oh, here's, this is a, I still find this astonishing. Uh, one would like to mix among the ranks of the believers in order to meet these philosophers who think they can rescue the God of religion by replacing him by an impersonal, shadowy, and abstract principle and to address them with the warning words, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, exclamation mark. Okay, so this, this is echoes of, of Blaise Pascal, passionate Christian, who, 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 who writes not the God of the philosophers, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, that's the mighty personality of religious doctrine. That's the, uh, the force that speaks to you from a flaming bush. Um, but these philosophers have reduced this mighty personality to a a shadowy abstract principle. And here you have the atheist Freud rising up and scolding them for taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You know, I find this a pretty astonishing passage. Anyway, finally being caught, facetious? I, I, I think he's I don't think he's being facetious. I think he's being passionate. I, you, I think he's yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, you, you mentioned earlier Heidegger and I'm wondering to what extent this is a that this is an engagement at that point. So this is 1930. This is 1930. Right. So with Jaspers and Heidegger, I'm wondering to what extent there's this kind of, you know, reaction against it <coughs> to extend something you suggested earlier. But also looking at, sorry, looking at what's going on in Germany at that time and the extent to which, you know, Heidegger is being taken up in a certain way intellectually in, in, right. 
in those circles. Um, to the extent that the Heidegger's war. walking around in a Nazi uniform. Right, practically. And oh, no, literally. literally. I have a picture so of him. So there you go. And then you, but also the sort of the, the trajectory after the humiliation of World War One, and right. I mean, that was, a, that was talk about trauma and, and the ways in which that affected the religious order in a certain sense because of the, right. the atrociousness of humanity. Right, right. So I'm just wondering to what extent there's that, because it's so vociferous. No, no, he's... What you're <coughs> he's, eating. Yes. Uh, it's hard to know uh, how much... You see, he was always putting philosophy down. Right. Um, would it be possible for you to sort of sit back, because I keep one, I, I can't make eye contact Sorry. with people down. Um, uh, so a, a colleague of mine last two years ago, uh, Andrew Brooke, professor of philosophy at Carleton, he presented a paper called Freud and Brentano. Did I mention this before? I think I did. F Freud, as a young man, was in love with Brentano, who was a distinguished philosopher at the University of Vienna, and he took all of his courses, and in his correspondence he talked about what a beautiful man and a beautiful mind and how he wanted Brentano to supervise his doctoral work, and then suddenly there's never any mention of Brentano again. And Freud is, for the rest of his life, he's making all of these hostile comments about philosophy as a pursuit of schizoid intellectuals who are turned away from their emotions and turned away from the world. You know, he's knocking philosophy all the time. Why would he do that, you know? I mean, um, now from those courses that he took with Brentano, he had to be hearing about Hegel. And he had to be hearing... Uh, uh, we know he does mention Kant in a few mm -hmm. places. So, I mean, Freud was more educated in philosophy than, than he wanted to admit. Um, whether he would have known anything about <coughs> Heidegger, I find rather doubtful. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, really? Well, you know, being in time, 1927, this, this, these passages are 1930. Uh, I, you know, he may have picked up snippets of it, but I don't think he would have had any sense of the real significance of it. I mean, Heidegger himself at that time was just beginning, he was writing, he wasn't having the huge impact that took some years to really yeah. take place, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. How much of this could have been concern, uh, concerned about what was going on on the social political level? Well, that was just starting. It was just starting, it yeah. Was I mean, the, 32, 33. the Lutheran church was starting to become corrupt, um, was starting to uh, collude with uh, the Nazis. Uh, Bonhoeffer was safely in New York and then he goes back uh, and the Lutheran Church splits into the, um, uh, the, collaborate, the collaborating church and the resisting church, right? But this, this was just beginning. So I don't know whether, I really, I really can't answer that. Um, so, so anyway, finally I caved and said, I mean, I, I remain very critical of some aspects of Freud's work, but here he convinced me. <laughs> and uh, I started calling myself a Christian atheist. Um, there's one other passage uh, where I profoundly disagree with what he has to say. And, and uh, this is startling in a different way. Um, so it wasn't until 1920 that Freud made aggression as fundamental a part of human nature as sexuality. Uh, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he introduces the Eros Thanatos theory. Up until then, aggression is a secondary reaction to frustration, sexual frustration or any other kind of threat or frustration. Aggression is not a drive for Freud. Um, it's a reaction to frustration. So finally, in 1920, he, this is the, now here you do have the sociopolitical, because the First World War has just ended, and it's mass slaughter. And also, throughout those years, Freud is finding masochists on his couch. I mean, self-defeating, self-sabotaging, self-harming people. And see, how can you make sense of that on the basis of the pleasure principle? Um, so finally, uh, uh, he overcomes his long-standing resistance to acknowledging aggression 
as equally as fundamental as sexuality in human nature, and he announces his final dual drive theory of Eros and Thanatos. But then he proceeds to project his own earlier naive optimism, which he, sh he shared with Enlightenment thought, he projects this now onto the Bible. Okay, here's, here's a quotation. This is, from, uh, this is from the new introductory lectures, the question of a Weltanschauung. He says, why have we ourselves needed such a long time before we decided to recognize an aggressive instinct? We should probably have met with little resistance if we'd wanted to ascribe an instinct with such a name to animals, but to include it in the human constitution appears sacrilegious, he says. It contradicts too many religious presumptions and social conventions. No, man must be naturally good, or at least good-natured. If he occasionally shows himself brutal, violent, or cruel, <coughs> these are only passing disturbances of his emotional life, for the most part provoked, or perhaps only the consequences of the inexpedient social regulations which he has hitherto imposed on himself. Okay, so here's Freud mocking um, those who uh, deny aggression as fundamental a part of human nature as sexuality. Uh, he's mocking people who think that man must be naturally good or good-natured and who rationalize away aggression as little oops, little slips, uh, due to passing disturbances or being provoked or due to inexpedient social regulations, okay? So, in this passage, Freud seems entirely unaware of the fact that the optimism of his own earlier thought that he now mocks belongs not to the Bible, but to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's notion of the noble savage corrupted by society, to Marxism, and to the environmentalistic social sciences stemming from, the, from irreligious enlightenment thought. It was his own loyalty to the anti-religious enlightenment and his estrangement from the Bible and the Father who beseeched him to return to it that prevented him from overcoming his own naivete until after the war and his deep and clinical experience finally made him see what the Bible had recognized all along. In its vision of human beings, I mean, he forgot what the Bible says. The Bible says human beings are fallen, perverse, and broken sinners, uh, even after salvation or redemption. The Bible is far more congruent with Freud's late, dark view of human nature than Freud was ever prepared to acknowledge. So here he attributes this naive goodness theory to the Bible of all things. Anyone who has the passing acquaintance with the Bible knows that that is not the Bible's view of human nature. You know, so this is, this, this, I find this bizarre. I mean, Freud is usually smarter than this. Uh, but there, 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 there's his, um, it's projection. He's, he, he had a great capacity for honesty. You know, he, he could admit when he was wrong. Like, take, take his theory of anxiety. Until 1926, he thought that repression caused anxiety. In 1926, he says, oops, I got it backwards. Anxiety causes repression. Now, that takes a big person to openly acknowledge a, a big error like that and to reverse himself, right? But not here. Here he's projecting his own naivete uh, onto the Bible, of all things. Um, you asked about his father complex earlier. Here's an example of the father uh, issue. Um, uh, in, 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 in Judaism, there's the bar mitzvah, but at least in certain varieties of European uh, uh, Jewry, uh, becoming, I think it's age 30 or 35, is another biggie. Uh, it's not quite as celebrated as the bar mitzvah is, but it's a big, a man becomes truly an adult member of the community or something. At it. But anyway, for his... 35th birthday, his father took the Jake, the um, Philipson Bible, which was the family Bible that he'd grown up with, and it was filled with all of these amazing illustrations of Old Testament themes and 
and uh, and I guess it was pretty uh, ratty, and the father had it all rebound in leather, and he gave it to uh, Freud on, on, on his 31st, uh, fifth birthday, and he had, he wrote this inscription. It's a really touching, I find it a really touching inscription. It's from a loving father, uh, beseeching his son to return to the ways of his people, and to the book of his people. Uh, and Freud was late for his father's funeral. He said he was detained at the barber. He gave his father a very cheap funeral. The family were all angry at Freud for not honoring his father more. I mean, Freud had a major unresolved Oedipus complex, Oedipal hostility towards his father. Um, I guess if he hadn't, he would, he would not have taught us as much as he taught us about the Oedipus complex. It takes someone with a doozy of an Oedipus complex to put the Oedipus complex on the map, right? Um, okay, how are we doing? Uh, 8.30. Uh, why don't we take our... Well, first of all, questions, comments, any discussion about religion? Because we'll leave religion at this point and we'll turn to Ferency. But is there any... Yeah, I have an observation. Um, Hang on. Just a, a curiosity. Uh, being neither Christian nor Jewish, how about a Protestant? <laughs> Commenting on both. Uh, my understanding um, um, is that the Jew, in, in, in contrast between the Christian and the Jewish, um, as a stereotype, there is a fairly large difference in how they view their gods. One a bit more benevolent than the other. Another, the Jewish one being a bit more um, authoritarian, demanding. But I don't see that in Freud at all. Um, I can't say it's either Christianity or um, Jewish character within his writings. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you'll get a big argument about that. Uh, uh, <laughs> many people will say that that's a bit of Christian anti-Semitism, really, to say that, that the loving God is a Christian invention. Uh, anyone who knows very much about um, Judaism will point out that the Old Testament is filled with images of a loving God, um, uh, as well as a harsh Jehovah, of course. They're both there. They're both there in Judaism. It's the idea that you don't get the loving God until you get to Christianity. That many people consider to be a little bit of Christian anti-Semitism to think that way. I mean, um, insofar as Freud is concerned, I mean, uh, I think Freud saw saw the idea of God, which for him is a fantasy. It's a wishful illusion. But I think he sees it both ways. He, I think he sees the the illusion of a good, rewarding, praising God, um, uh, uh, forgiving God, but he also sees um, the harsh, critical, severe, punishing God. He sees both, I think. Um, yeah, I think they're both there. I think probably the harsh one is a little bit more there. I, I, I'm thinking of the way Freud builds his theory of the superego as as, um, you know, uh, the internalized authority, for Freud, that internalized authority is very much the father, which again is a problem in Freudian theory, because, uh, again, I, I owe this to Eli Sagan, who, who points out something obvious, which is that our first boss, our first tyrant, is the mother. Um, she's this giantess. She's scary. Um, so, so the mater the early maternal superego, um, which is based on the frightening mother figure. Now there are hints of it in Freud. After all, the head of the Medusa. Freud's paper on the head of the Medusa—that the head that's covered with the hair that's like snakes, right? 
and, and he says the multiplication of the snakes is, is, means really the opposite. It means the absence of any snakes at all. It means castration, the absence of the penis. The multiplication of penises suggests the absence. And this head of Medusa is painted on, on Athena's shield. And when Athena goes into battle, she just raises her shield, and the men see the head of the Medusa, and they drop their spears, and they run. So this is the reaction of men to the castrating, omnipotent, frightening, phallic female figure, the so-called phallic mother. Now, now men are, are have to see the powerful mother, uh, mother. They have to see her as phallic, because in patriarchal ideology, you can't be powerful unless there's a penis. Where there's no penis, there's no power. That's patriarchy. So, so if you're going to have a frightening female, you've got to equip her with a, a, a phallus. Um, but this is a real problem uh, for a lot of men, and I think for Freud himself, because of his mother, because of his unresolved hostility towards his mother. I think he had, had a major fear of the pre oedipal mother. Uh, I think that's why he couldn't go there. Um, but a lot of men have this problem. I mean, I've known many men who can defend themselves perfectly well in business when they have to deal with sharky men. But when they have to deal with uh, a sharky female, they're helpless. 